for the What's that? One of the worst solutions. I see it. Okay. Well, welcome to our LEC presentation. It is a pleasure and an honor to have Wash University's own Professor Bruce Carlson give this LEC talk. Bruce is a neuroscientist that studies animal communication, sensory systems, and the evolution of brain behavior. One of his favorite study systems is weekly electric fish, fish that sense and generate electric fields, not for stunning, but for perception, communication, and navigation. These are very good fish, in my opinion. Bruce was born in Germany in a small town called Ingolstadt, close to Nuremberg. A little fun background information. He grew up in Chicago and is a lifelong Cubs fan. So, you want you guys to know that. Uh, I am a Philadelphia sports fan. So. <laughs> Bruce attended the University of Miami as an undergraduate with a double major in biology and marine science. This is where he discovered his passion for neuroethology, the neural basis of natural animal behavior. Uh, for a senior honors thesis, he explored how the chemical properties of sea hair ink deter crab prediction. Sea hairs are gastropods that are good in the seaweed. Bruce went on to do his PhD uh, on electromotor systems of weekly, of, of weekly electric fish at Cornell, where he worked with Carl Hopkins. For his postdoc, he worked with Mishaki Kawasaki at the University of Virginia studying electrosensory systems. Bruce started his lab in the biology department in Washington in 2008. He has since expanded his research to include comparative approaches, field work, phylogenetic analysis, and the evolutionary model, modeling of sensory systems and neuroscience. Um, he studies topics like the neural basis of stimulus timing, evolution of sensory perception and behavior, behavioral innovation and evolution of brain structure, and the energetic basis for extreme increases in brain size. All pretty cool stuff. So with that introduction, Bruce, come on up. All right, thanks, John. Uh, and thanks to you all for coming out. Um, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, a pretty new project in the lab. It's also an ongoing project. Um, we have some early insights, uh, but this is also rapidly developing uh, projects that um, we still have a long way to go. So I'm, I'm excited to hear people's uh, thoughts on, on this project. And what I thought I'd do today is uh, start with a, a, some general background on the study system on electric fish, because most of you probably do not have any familiarity with those, these fish at all. Then I'll try to kind of give you a general sense of the topic that we're tackling. Then I'll get into the specifics of our study. So I think many of you probably know that uh, some fish have what we call electroreception. Probably the, the, the most widely known fish uh, that are electroreceptive are fertilizers fish, sharks, skates, and rays. Um, and so these are fish. So what you're seeing here, this is a picture of the snout of a tiger shark. And you see all those black dots there. These are little pores in the surface of the skin. And they give rise to canals that go down, dive down into the fish's body. And at the base of those canals are electroreceptors. These are sensory receptors that detect electric fields. And they look something like this in the schematic of, 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 a, of a dogfish. Check. And for decades, it was a source of controversy as to what these pores were actually used for. And it was a definitive behavioral experiments in the 60s and 70s by Al Ad Kamin that showed that they were actually electroreceptors. And they showed that these the fish used that electro electroreceptors primarily to find hidden predators. Okay. We've since learned that they also use it to find uh, potential mates and to also avoid potential predators. But the primary mechanism is to detect prey that might be hidden by detecting their electric fields. And this is something that they use at very close range. So it's not something that they're gonna use to find prey off in the distance, 
it's something where they're going to use vision, smell, um, sound, things like that to, to roughly find prey. But it's that last moment of strike where they, they find, locate the prey and actually attack it. And it turns out that as far as we can tell, there's very strong evidence that electroreception reception was actually found in the earliest vertebrates, that it's an ancestral vertebrate trait. And so what I'm showing here is a very rough phylogeny of vertebrates, and it shows some extant species that still had electroreception. reception. So it's found uh, in, in um, the jawless fish, like lampreys. Like I said, it's found in cartilaginous fishes, the shark skates and rays and that fish. It's found in a few bony fishes, like sturgeon, paddlefish, uh, polypterus, the, the living fossil coelacanth. It's also found in um, aquatic amphibians, and it's even found in mammals. So the duck-billed platypus, its duck bill is, is loaded with electroreceptors. And there's some evidence, not super definitive, but some evidence that some dolphins may have also had electroreception. But for reasons that really are kind of a mystery, this sensory ability was lost in what are called teleost fishes. So teleost fishes, these are the overwhelming majority of, of bony fishes. So when you think of typical bony fish, it's a teleost. Salmon, tuna, um, cichlids, catfish, goldfish, zebrafish, et cetera. These are all teleost fishes. And it, like I said, for reasons that are unclear, that lineage of fishes lost the ability to sense electric fields, which is really a mystery because it's a very useful sense in an aquatic or marine environment. And I'm zooming in here on um, the expansion of the teleos fishes. And within two different groups of these fishes, within the osteoglossomorphs and the asteroidophysids, I don't memorize those, remember those names, they actually reinvented electroreception. They re evolved it de novo. And then in smaller groups within both of those clades are fishes that actually evolved electric organs. So these are not sensory receptors for detecting electric fields, but organs that are actually actively generating electricity and sending it into the environment. When I, people hear that I study electric fish, one of the first things they think about is the electric eel, right? That's probably the most famous electric fish. These are fish that generate, uh, the largest on record is about 800 volts of electricity, which they use as an offensive and defensive weapon, right? They can, they can stun a potential predator and scare it off, they can stun prey and make them make them easy prey. There's a, several strong electric fish like the torpedo ray in the ocean, stargazer in the ocean, and the African electric catfish. Now we've known, humans have known about the special powers of these fish for centuries, right? Like obviously, you go and grab a torpedo ray or an, or an electric eel, you get a really painful numbing sensation, right? It doesn't, doesn't take a genius to figure out that there's something special about that fish. But we didn't know it was electricity, of course, until the discovery of electricity. And these fish actually played a huge role in the discovery of electricity. One, and the first um, actual electrochemical battery was actually built as a physical model of an electric field organ. And those of you that read the Origin of Species from Darwin, you know that he has a, a whole chapter in his book devoted to basically being a, the biggest possible critic of his idea of uh, evolution by natural selection, where basically he tries to find examples in biology that don't seem to neatly fit his, uh, his conception of gradual, functional, adaptive change leading to evolutionary innovation. And these fish are actually one topic that he talks about. And so he has this classic quote that I love, the electric organs of fishes offer another case of special difficulty where it is impossible to conceive by what steps these wondrous organs have been produced. So here's the problem as he saw. It. So you know, our nervous system uses electricity, right? When you, when you contract your muscles, there's small electrical spikes happening in your muscle fibers. And so you can imagine what you can convert those small electrical spikes into a big organ that generates much more electricity. But how do you get from, you know, these feeble little electrical spikes in your muscles to something that generates 800 volts by gradual adaptive modifications, right? What, what, what use, of, in other words, is a weak electric organ? And it was about 100 years later that the German Hans Listmann discovered what the functions of weak electric organs are. Basically, they mediate communication, 
just can talk to each other with electricity, just like I'm talking to you with sound right now. And they have a process called active echolocation, which is similar to uh, echolocation in bats and dolphins. Slightly different, but the nuances aren't important. But they can sense distortions in their electric field caused by objects in the surrounding environment with electrical properties that differ from the surrounding water. And so they can basically sense their way in the dark using electricity. And this ability has evolved multiple times in fish. So the fish that I'm going to talk about today and that we're mostly studying in my lab are called more mired electric fishes or elephant fishes, as they're known. There's over 200 described species, and there's many more that have yet to be described. And they're found throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the Nile River Basin. And if you look at a cross section at the base of their tail, that area is called the caudal peduncle. That's where their electric organ is located. These are basically modified muscle cells that have lost their ability to contract, but still generate electricity. And when they all are active in synchrony with each other, their small electrical spikes add up together. It's like a bunch of batteries in series. And basically the electric eel is just a bigger version of this. It just has more cells and a bigger organ, so it makes a bigger voltage. And if you stick a pair of wires in the water, a recording electrode near the fish's head and a reference electrode near the tail, you amplify that, you pick up what we call the electric organ discharge, or the EOD. And this, this fish will produce this pulse of electricity day in, day out, throughout its life. And they also have electroreceptors. So these small dots you see scattered all over the head of the fish, these are the sensory receptors that detect these electric signals. And these fish actually have three different sensory types of sensory receptors that each give rise to a different sensory pathway that serves a different function in the life of the animal. So they have what are called canola organs for electric communication. Does anyone speak German? Do you know what canola means? It means tuber. And, and it's, it's an apt description because these organs look like little tubers embedded in the skin. And these function for electric communication. They have another receptor called lamyromast that they use to attack the local location. Then they have what are called ampullary receptors. These are like the receptors in sharks and skates and rays that they use to passively pick up external electric fields. And for each of these pathways, the signal that the fish cares about and the noise that can interfere with detection of that signal are different. Right? So in the communication pathway, it wants to hear other fish's signals. But its own signal is a source of noise that can interfere with that. Situation is reversed for active electric location. It wants to pay attention to its own signal, ignore the signal signals of surrounding uh, neighboring fish. And then the angular system, it wants to detect external fields, and its own signal is a big source of noise that can interfere with that. I'm just going to focus on one of these pathways today, the one that we study most in my lab, and that's the communication pathway. And address the question of how is it that the fish is able to ignore its own signal, but attend to the signals of neighboring fish? And so I want to give you kind of an intuitive sense for this problem, because this is actually a problem that every animal faces and every sensory system faces, distinguishing self from other. So imagine you're looking at an image. Right, famous image here, Van Gogh's Starry Night. Okay, so you're you're fixated on where that red cross is located. You're looking at that image, and if you were to move your eyes, the image that's hitting your retina is going to shift. Right, if you were to move upward, that image is going to shift down. That image that's hitting your eyes is going to shift down. But that's not actually what you perceive, right? Like move your eyes around this room. You don't sense that the, even though the image that's in your retina is moving around as you move your eyes, you don't sense the world moving around, right? You sense a, you perceive a stable image and your gaze is just moving around within that image. Right, you perceive a static image within which your gaze is shifting. But let's say the exact same retinal image happened, not because of you moving your eyes, but let's say that, that that painting actually slipped down the wall and actually moved. You would perceive movement of the object, right? You would perceive that if the object actually moving. So imagine you're viewing an object. You can get a shift in the image hitting your, your, your retina because your eyes move, 
or you can get the exact same shift in the image due to the object itself moving. The image that's hitting your retina is the exact same in both cases. So how do you know the difference? How do you know that that movement of the image hitting your eyes is because you're moving your eyes versus the image itself moving? How, do you, how does your brain figure out that problem? Well, this was something that was recognized early in the history of neuroscience. Uh, there's this classic paper by two Germans on Holt and Middlestadt of the Das Reafferenz principle, or in English, the, re the Reafferenz principle. And basically, neuroscientists have about afferents. This is what we define as sensory input. So any sensory input coming into the nervous system, we, we define that as afferents. And von Holst and Middlestadt distinguish between two different sources of afferents, reafference and ex-afference. So reafference, they defined as sensory input caused by your own actions, right? Like hearing myself speak right now, that's a reafferent stimulus for me. But it's an ex-afferent stimulus for you, right? So reafference is self-generated sensory input. Ex-afferent is external sensory input. It's coming from outside you. And so basically for your visual system to distinguish between movement caused by your own actions versus movement coming from the outside world, that means your brain must be able to distinguish between reafferent and ex-afferent sensory input. And so the question is, how does your brain do that? And they and others came up with this concept of what we call a corollary discharge. And basically, the idea here is that the sensory consequences of motor output or reafference are removed by a corollary discharge. And that corollary discharge is basically an internal copy of the motor command, in this case, to move your eyes. So you send out a motor command to move your eyes, and there's an internal copy of that motor command that gets sent to visual regions of the brain. And that corollary discharge provides these sensory processing regions with a negative image of the sensory input expected to result from the movement. Okay, so you're sending out a motor command. There are predictable consequences of that motor command to the sensory input that's going to go into your visual system. And the corollary discharge basically provides a negative image of those expected consequences to subtract it out. And that's going to be specific to reafferent sensory input. It's going to let any, any external sources of sensory input, any exactor input, it's going to go right through because there's no negative image to come to that, that out. So it's basically providing a filter to filter out the consequences of your own movement so only external stimuli get through. And they actually didn't just come up with this concept, they actually did experiments on themselves to test this idea. So here's the first experiment they did. They wanted to uncouple movement of the eye from this corollary discharge signal. And so the way they did that is they actually physically moved their eye independent of the normal pathway by which your brain does that. And so you can actually, you can actually do this experiment yourself. So you can cover one eye and then don't touch your eyeball directly, please. <laughs> but you can gently touch on your eyelid and very gently, just give it a little nudge to just move your eyeball a little bit. What happens to the visual world when you do that? It moves, right? Right, you move your eyeball and the visual world that you're seeing moves. So, so I mean, I confirmed your eyeball moves, the visual thing that's hitting your eyeball shifts. So when you go through the normal pathway, when your normal motor pathway to move those, your eye does that, you don't perceive that, that, that visual motion. So this was, this was support of this idea that when you decouple the motor command from the movement of the eye, you do perceive actual visual movement. They did a second experiment where they got, took syringes full of the lo local anesthetic lidocaine, and they actually stuck them into their ocular muscles and injected them with lidocaine. And what that basically what that meant is that if they gave the motor command to move their eyes, the eyes would not actually move. But that corollary discharge signal to get into the sensory region was still active. 
And so there was no reafferent input, but there was this negative image that normally would cancel the reafferent input. And so as they were, yes, man, you know what happened? <laughs> it's pretty trippy, right? So just by willing their eyes to move, the visual world just goes flying off in different directions. It sounds very scary and disorienting. So I only brought a handful of syringes, but <laughs> no, I'm not going to let you do that. I don't have IRB approval for that. Okay, so this is the basic idea that we've got these internal copies of our motor commands that we use to subtract out the predictable consequences of our own actions. And we call these corollary discharges. And there's this great review paper that covers uh, corollary discharge. Like I said, this is something that's found in all animals, in all sensory systems. This is a universal problem that we all have to deal with. And these corollary discharges serve several functions. And what I'm going to focus on today is just sensory filtering. How to, how to filter out your own signal so that you only receive information about signals coming from outside. And again, it's going to be in these more minor electric fishes that generate these pulses of electricity to communicate with each other. And here is the pathway. Pathways. Don't worry about memorizing these details. I'm going to break it down into the, the important elements. But basically, we've got three different pathways here. We've got a motor pathway that the fish uses to generate signal. We've got a sensory pathway that they use to process these signals. And then there's this corollary discharge pathway by which the electromotor pathway talks to the other sensory pathway. So in blue, it's showing the motor pathway. There's a command nucleus in the, the hindbrain that sends information down the spinal cord to excite spinal motor neurons. Those spinal motor neurons are what excite the electric organ and cause it to generate an electrical pulse. Then in red, we've got these canola organ electroreceptors that respond to electric pulses. They send that information up into the hindbrain, in this area called the electrosensory lobe. And then from there, the information gets sent into the midbrain, into this area called EL, or exterolateral, because it's part of the brain that sticks out the side of the brain. It's extralateral. Then there's this purple pathway, the corollary discharge pathway, where you can see the command nucleus sends information up through this pathway up into the first sensory region of the brain. So if you look at that first sensory region of the brain called NELL, the electrosensory lobe, you can see it's getting two sources of input. It's getting sensory input from the receptors and it's getting in input about that, that provides information about the fish's own motor output. Here's how it looks kind of simplified and schematized. So we've got command neurons, they excite spinal motor neurons, that excites the electric organ, and the fish produces its own EMPs. It is going to excite its own electric receptors. Other fish's EMPs are also going to stimulate its electric receptors. And information about both types of EMPs are going to get sent up into the brain, into the electrosensory lobe. But there's this separate pathway, this corollary discharge pathway coming from the command nucleus to the sensory region that inhibits sensory responses in, in that sensory region. And that's only going to be active every time the fish produces its own signal. So basically, whenever its own signal is seen as its own electroreceptors, it's getting an addition at the exact same time that shuts down responses to its own signal and lets responses to other fish's, fish's signal get through. So this is basically a filter, filter out responses to its own signal so it can only listen to the signals of other fish. Here's the basic method by which we study this. So when we do experiments in these fish, they're, they're paralyzed pharmacologically, so they can't move. And this also silences the, neuro, the, the, the junction that causes that, that uh, between motor neurons and the electric organ. So it also electrically silences them. But all those pathways in the brain that normally make the electric organ fire, they're still active. And you can actually stick a wire next to the fish's tail and record the activity of their spinal motor neurons that normally in an intact fish that wasn't silenced would be immediately followed by its, by its electric signal, by its EOD. And so you can record that, but we call it, we refer to that as a fixed EOD. It's not the actual EOD, 
but it's a marker of the fish's motor output of when it would produce a signal if we had a silent fish. And we can record that through the VOD, and then we can deliver an electrical stimulus at some fixed delay after that VOD. And we can record the responses of neurons, sensory neurons in the brain in response to those electrical stimuli. And so here's an example. What you're seeing here, this is the timing of the fifth EOD for the EOD command, the EODC. And we're delivering stimuli at different delays following the EOD command. This shows the electrical artifact of the stimulus. And then right after the electrical artifact, you have an evoked potential. So in the book, this is in the book potential, this is recording from a region of the brain with a pretty big blunt electrode. So you're not recording from an individual neuron or even a few neurons. You're basically recording the summated activity of dozens or hundreds of neurons. So it's kind of like a bit more precise version of an electroencephalogram or EEG. And so you see, we get we stimulate, and after a short delay, we get a, a response to that stimulus. But if you notice, that response is blocked at delays of around three or four milliseconds after the, that pick of the UV. That's what the corollary discharge is doing. So that's the exact window of time in an intact fish that hadn't been electrically silenced. That's when its own EOD would occur. So it's basically blocking sensory responses to signals during the exact window of time when its own signal would be occurring. Okay, so you've probably been wondering, all right, where's the evolution here? What's going on? Well, here's the problem. This has been studied in a couple of species before our work. But it turns out that these, the signals that these fish produce are incredibly diverse. So like I said, there's over 200 species of these fish that, that have been described, and probably dozens more that have yet to be described. And these electric signals they produce, these EOPs, they're species-specific, and they're very diverse. So they, they vary in the number of, of phases they have. They vary in the polarities of those phases, whether they're positive or negative. One thing that they, is very salient is pulse duration. So you see here, here's a really short pulse, that's about half a millisecond long. Here's a longer pulse, that's about 10 milliseconds. So the question that we wanted to ask, and this is a project led by my postdoc, or Mata for short, is how has this corollary discharge inhibition evolved with the diversification of these signals? You've got species that have these really short signals, species that have much longer signals. What has happened in this pathway to be able to, to, to deal with this great diversity between species? And so this shows a sampling of the species that, that Mata studied. You can see they vary quite a bit in the duration of these pulses. There's this one species here where these pulses actually vary quite a bit just within the species. And here's an example. Uh, this is the same kind of plot that I just showed you, delivering stimuli at different delays after the specific EOD command. This is a short duration species. And you can see the responses are blocked around three milliseconds after. The, 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 this fictive EOD command. Here's the same exact thing from a member of the same genus, but with a much longer EOD. And you can see that inhibition is delayed. It happens later. Okay. And so we quantified this. So you can measure these sensory responses across a range of delays after the EOD command, and you can normalize it from zero to one, and you see this very characteristic inhibition curve. Where you see there's this inhibition of the response with these narrow ranges of delays. And you can measure several things about this. So set an 80% threshold, so we can measure things like the onset and the offset of the inhibition, the duration of the inhibition, or the peak time where the, where the maximum inhibition occurs. And I'm going to spare you all the details of all the possible comparisons here and just give you the take home message. What Mata found was that there was a very strong correlation between the onset of that inhibition and the delay to the first peak in the EOD. So, by that, I mean 
Remember that first peak in the year, the occurs. That was very predictive of the timing of this inhibitory window. So that in fish that had longer EAD for that first peak was delayed, this inhibitory window was shown. Now, why might that be? Well, so it turns out that the stimulus that, that a receptor receives, an individual receptor on the fish's body receives, depends on where that stimulus is coming from. So if you consider a stimulus coming from outside the fish, from another fish, this might be what we would call the head positive EOD. So by convention, just by arbitrary convention, when we plot these EODs, we plot them where you put a recording electrode on by the head and a reference electrode by the tail. And we call that our head positive EOD. Well, you imagine if there's a, a fish outside that generates one of these pulses, it's going to send current passing through the body of this fish. And so on the side of the body where that fish is located, that current's going to be an inward current, right? It's going to be flowing from outside to in. The other side of the body is going to be opposite. It's going to be an outward current that flows from inside the fish's body to out. And so those signals are going to be opposite in polarity by receptors on the opposite side of the, opposite side of the body. But if you think of a self-generated EOD, that's generated internally. That's coming from inside the body to out at all part, parts of the body surface. And so they're all going to experience a stimulus that ha that's reversed compared to what we arbitrarily define as our head positive EOD. So we wanted to ask, okay, when the fish generates its own signal, these are the stimuli that its receptors receive. Let's see how the receptors actually respond to these signals. So it's very relatively easy to record from these sensory receptors. They're actually spiking receptors. They generate action potentials, which is very rare for sensory neurons. Most sensory neurons, like your hair cells in your ear, the photoreceptors in your eye, they don't generate action potentials. They generate much smaller receptor potentials. But these known receptors are spiking. And so you can take a fish that's paralyzed, but not invasive. You don't have to do any surgery on it. And you can put an electrode right up next to one of these receptors and you can record their electrical activity, not invasively. And the paralytic will wear off and the fish will be fine. And so you see here it's an example of some spikes and recording from one of those receptors. And then this is showing examples from three different species, each of which has a different EOD duration, presenting those in an inverted polarity that simulates what they would actually receive in response to their own signal. And then above each of those EOD stimuli, that's showing the spike rate of these receptors. And what you can see is that in that each case, the receptors show a big increase in spiking right after the first peak of the EOD. I and mean, there's actually a very tight relationship across species. So that if you look at the delay to the canal normal response as a function of the delay, the first peak in the EOD, it's a very tight relationship. So what this means is that this corollary discharge inhibition is matched to the timing of responses to self-generated EODs. And to really conclusively demonstrate this, Matza first recorded simultaneously in unparalyzed fish the EOD and the EOD command from the tail. Then he paralyzed the fish and did the physiology experiment in the brain to characterize this inhibitory window, this corollary discharge window. And what you can see, we're comparing a short EOD species and a long EOD species, that that window of inhibition is perfectly matched to the timing of that first peak in the EOD. So if you're a species that has a longer EOD, the first peak in that EOD comes later, and that corollary discharge inhibition also comes correspondingly later. So that there's a very tight match between when you're going to respond to your own signal and when your corollary district is going to inhibit responses in the sensory system. Matza found that this is even true within species. So he studied that species that has quite a bit of interspecific variation in the EOD duration. And he saw the same kind of relationship, this tight correlation between the two. So this is basically the conclusion of this first bit of the talk. 
You compare fish that have short EODs versus long EODs. What they've done is they've correspondingly shifted the timing of this corollary discharge inhibition to perfectly match the timing of responses to their own EODs. So now the kinds of questions that we're pursuing are, where in this corollary discharge pathway does this happen? There's these multiple steps going from the command nucleus to the sensory region. Where is this actually happening? Where, where is this delay being implemented? And then what are the underlying mechanisms that cause this shift in timing? What's it, what is it actually doing to neurons there that cause this shift? And then something we're very interested in are the same mechanisms that are operating developmentally within species also operating evolutionarily between species? Is it, is it the exact same substrate that's being modified with, as species diverge and as individuals change over their life? And so the first studies that, that we've undertaken to get at this take advantage of a really well-known feature of these fish's biology. So these fish breed during the rainy season. So when the rains come down, water levels go up, the conductivity of the water drops to basically almost pure deionized water. It's kind of, it's really kind of insane how pure the water is during the rainy season. And this causes uh, testosterone levels in males to surge. And in most species, testosterone acts directly on the electric organ to cause an elongation of the EOD. So, so the males have an elongated EOD. And it turns out that the most dominant males have the most elongated EOD and the most submissive males have, have the least elongated EOD. And it's all caused by testosterone. And so this is, provides a really convenient experimental toolkit to precisely manipulate the duration of a fish's discharge and see what, ha what happens to its corollary discharge pattern. So this is showing, um, here's an example from a vehicle-treated fish and a testosterone-treated fish at the top before treatment, and then these are days after treatment. And you can see this clear elongation of the EOD with the testosterone the treatment. Then in these plots, you see four fish from each group. You see with testosterone treatment, the EOD gets longer. Accordingly, the, the spectral power, the peak power frequency of the EOD gets lower. And this key feature that I was talking about, the delays of the first peak in the EOD, gets longer. Not surprisingly, this, when you, this testosterone treatment by elongating the EOD also causes an increased delay in the response of the sensory receptors. Right? As the delay of that first peak gets later, the responses get later. And these dots, when they're connected, it's just showing uh, receptors that not so recorded from multiple times over subsequent days. So, like I said, these fish can survive this, and you can go back and record from them again and again. And testosterone causes a shift in the timing of this corollary discharge inhibition. So, if you compare a vehicle treated fish with a testosterone treated fish, you see that the timing of that corollary discharge in addition is delayed in testosterone treated fish. And this just shows not quite raw data, but basically one step removed from the raw data, where it's showing four fish from each group control and testosterone treated. And you can see for yourself this shift in the timing of this corollary discharge in addition. It starts a little bit later and it's extended in duration. So this is not terribly surprising based on everything I've told you, right? Testosterone causes the EOD to elongate, and it also causes the corollary discharge pattern to be shifted so that it maintains this precise match and will still block responses to its own signal. But how's that happening? So one possible answer is that testosterone is acting directly on both the electric organ and on the brain to cause this correlated shift in timing. Okay. But another possibility, and one that I find especially intriguing, is that the substance is actually acting directly on the brain, but instead it acts on the electric organ, it changes the EOD, that changes the sensory stimulus the fish receives, and then through plasticity, through neuroplasticity, through learning basically, the circuit could figure it out. Could it could basically adjust the timing to match, and this is this has a lot of intuitive appeal because it's just a catch-all mechanism, right? So it doesn't matter if your EOD changes because of testosterone or some other factor, 
or whether it's a developmental change or an evolutionary change, it's basically the system is trying to just learn what its own signal is and adjust accordingly. And that can really facilitate developmental change and evolutionary divergence. And so that for that reason, I was very, I wouldn't say what it, but I was pretty invested in this hypothesis. I thought it was a really cool idea. And so we submitted the NSF grant for this project with that as like the framework that like evolutionary and developmental change through plasticity, right? Big sexy title. And while we were waiting to get the reviews back, basically we found out we were totally wrong. We were completely wrong. Fortunately, it was well received and we got the grant so that I didn't have to completely reinvent the grant. Um, but it turns out that the hormones are actually acting directly on the brain to cause a correlated shift in the corollary discharge and the signal. So how do we figure that out? Well, there was actually some precedence for this idea that testosterone would not be acting directly on the brain. So it turns out this is a classic study by Andrew Bass and Carl Hopkins, my uh, former PhD mentor. And they showed that when you treat fish with testosterone, you get this elongation of the EOD, and you also get a shift in the frequency tuning of their receptors. Their receptors become more sensitive to lower frequency signals, which is a good match to the shift in the EOD, to a longer EOD. And they, what they found was that this was not because testosterone was acting directly on the electroreceptors. It was an indirect effect of the changing signal. That the receptors were shifting their tuning in response to their own signal. And how did they show this? Well, here's the fish again. I showed you that the electric organ is located here at the base of the tail. And what you can do is just take in, a, in an anesthetized fish, just take a small needle, and stick it into the spinal cord, just anterior to the electric organ, to basically transect the spinal cord, to cut the spinal cord. And that cuts off all the motor neurons that innervate the electric organ. So you, you surgically silence the fish. But all the other motor neurons that control all these muscles, they're all anterior to that incision site. So you can actually you can do this very simply and precisely, very quickly. The fish is electrically silent, but it swims around, it has posture, it's totally normal otherwise. And they showed in this study that when they did this, when they silenced the fish, and they had testosterone, there was no change in there, and no change in their electric. So this was another piece of evidence that made us think, okay. Maybe this is not a direct effect of testosterone on the brain. Maybe this is due to feedback and plasticity. Now, of course, it gets a little challenging to. We're using the, the signal from the spinal motor neuron as a mo as a fixed monitor of the tissue behavior output. That was no longer available because we didn't ramp up to the spinal cord. But you can record in the brain in this manner that you normally cause the electrical impact. And they, and they, and in fact, they divided the entire about two to three milliseconds before the spinal cord. So basically what this meant was, Mazda just had to take a step back and instead of recording from the tail, the fixed motor output, he had to go into the hindbrain to record the fixed motor output. So he would simultaneously record from the command neuron, he record the fixed motor output, and he would record from the sensory region, and that amount to this effective corollary discharge inhibition. And as I was saying before, we got the same result. So even in a surgically silent fish that didn't, weren't able to generate their own electric signal, the stop would still cause a delay in the time of the corollary discharge. And again, here are the here's the traces. The inventory traces. So you still get the slight delay in the outset and the elongation in the inventory. So it's clear that testosterone is acting directly on the brain to cause this shift in timing to match. The shift in timing of responses to their own signal. So, some specific conclusions. There's a precise match between the timing of electroreceptor responses to self generated EODs and corollary discharge inhibition, both within and among species. As EOD duration increases, the delay from EOD output to electroreceptor response also increases. And as EOD duration increases, the delay from EOD output to corollary discharge inhibition increases. So there's maintains this precise match between those two things. And testosterone acts directly on the corollary discharge circuitry to maintain a precise match between responses to self-generated EODs and the timing of corollary discharge inhibition. So testosterone elongates the EODs. That results in an increased delay from EOD output to, to sensory response. 
and at the same time, testosterone delays and prolongs the corollary discharge inhibition to maintain that precise match. And this is we just uploaded this file archive, and we're in the whole process of getting it reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to end with some future directions. So this is a new graduate in the lab, Marie Bertina. And basically his main goal of his thesis is to figure out where is testosterone acting in the brain and what is it doing to cause these delays. And he mastered a really challenging feat where he can take a single fish, do the surgery and anesthesia on it, paralyze it, put it in the rig. And then he's able to go and precisely locate every single part of the brain in this pathway, going all the way from the command nucleus to the sensory region. And so what you're looking at here, there's the fictive motor command recorded from the spinal cord at the top. And these are all the different stages in the pathway, recording electrical activity that's synced with that motor output. And so he can do this in, in an individual fish and identify where in this pathway is there a shift in the timing. And this is still preliminary, but it seems to be holding up that it seems to be happening at this very last stage, the neurons have actually inhibited the sensory part of the brain. And so this is comparing two fish, two control fish, and two fish free of the testosterone. This dashed line shows the timing of their fictive motor output. And what you notice is that in the testosterone treated fish, the onset of activity is slightly delayed. And they tend to generate three spikes of electrical spikes as opposed to two. That would perfectly account for what we see here, where the onset is slightly delayed and it's elongated. And so the future directions we're going with this project are, are where does testosterone act? Like we said, we, we, I think we've got a good idea right now. The next question is, how does testosterone affect the cellular morphology or physiology of neurons in that part of the brain to cause these changes in activity and to delay these, this activity? And again, are the same mechanisms that are responsible for shift in the timing of corollary distribution addition across species and individuals? Is it, is, the, is it the same substrate? And we got this negative result where we show that testosterone is acting directly on this pathway to shift timing. But we're not yet ready to completely rule out the possibility that plasticity is playing a role in this circuit, perhaps in refining it, perhaps uh, in other ways. We're going to be studying that directly because showing that testosterone acted directly on the brain doesn't rule out the possibility that plasticity is playing a role. And that, like I said, that is a very attractive hypothesis because that can really explain how these systems are able to deal with developmental and rapid evolutionary change in these signals. So some broader conclusions that I hope you can take home. Behavior is not a simple matter of you know, sensory input, behavioral output, right? That for animals to make sense of the world and respond appropriately, they need to integrate information and sensory input with internal models of their own behavioral output. And as behavior changes across development or evolution, those internal models need to change. And it's, I think it's a very interesting question. How do animals change those models to maintain this precise match? That's not trivial, right? How is it that testosterone is acting on different parts of your nervous system in a perfectly coordinated way? How, how did that evolve? So what are the mechanisms mediating that change? And how is a precise match between behavioral output and internal models achieved? So I just want to end by thanking the folks that did this work. Um, Matza and Marty are the, the, the ones who did all the bulk of the work that I talked about today. Also, the rest of the lab, and then um, our various sources of funding. And thanks to all of you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take questions on general stuff about fish, uh, general stuff about corollary discharges, or more specific stuff about this project. Uh, I'll pass this around, but first I'm going to ask a question. Um, one's kind of a background question, normally ecological. Um, these sensory systems that they have, these, these weak electric fish, how does that allow them to act differently and carve out their own niche in their world broad way? Yeah, so one thing, so you'll read in a lot of textbooks that the, um, these fish tend to live in muddy, turbid environments. 
that's sometimes true. They can also occur in very crystal clear, beautiful environments. But one thing that is pretty much universal is they're all nocturnal. And so one kind of like bats using echolocation, it seems to have opened up the nocturnal niche where a lot of critters in aquatic and marine habitats are sound asleep and they're able to freely move around the environment and sense perfectly well. Um, so that's a big thing. And it also gives them the ability to do things like recognize individuals or male versus females or time specific versus heteropacific, again, in the dark, also in environments that are very cluttered. So if you imagine at the bottom of an African river or stream, it's full of detritus, it's full of roots. It's very, even if in good sunlight, it's very difficult to see. But they can use their electric sense to sense the, their immediate environment and detect individuals and identify who they are. And they also use it to, to feed it and yep. to find a friend. Yeah, so they tend to kind of hide out in their own personal territory during the day. And when the sun goes down, they all emerge and then go start hunting in their environment. And when the sun comes up, they go back to their territory. Okay, and then my kind of related one is, are there species that coexist? And if so, what kind of functional differences do, do they have that allow them to to their Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can share it again. I wanted to pull up an image here. I'll reshare it after I okay. pull that image up. And I will not do that again. <laughs> So this image here, all of these fish, there's like 18 or so here, they're all from this one river in Gabon, the middle river of Gabon, so Gabon is here on the equator and west coast of Africa. They're all from that one river there. So these are all some type of coexisting. So we know there's at least dozens of species that, that coexist. Okay. And, and some are better, better able to sense we don't really have a good handle we don't really know how they interact with each other we don't have a good handle on how they partition their niches with each other there's a lot of their basic ecology that we are completely ignoring related to more specifically you talked about some have more have more testosterone i'm curious what the function consequence is that for remaining success or yeah so what we know, and this is a study I did early in my PhD, um, if you set up a naturalistic environment where you induce breeding behavior, the males will form a, a very clear dominance hierarchy. And the most dominant males have the highest level of testosterone and they have the longest ear beads. Um, and that seems to reinforce the dominance hierarchy, but it's, they're also more attractive to females. And the longer ear beads, what is that doing in terms of making them look like? Well, the fish can certainly perceive the duration of an energy. And so it, the males can, can perceive the duration, the females can perceive the duration, and the females are most attracted to the longest EOGs. In fact, I've seen them in some playback experiments that I did um, where they would actually spawn with an electrode that I was playing back at a long EOG um, So they're very powerful signal. And as to why long EOGs may serve that function, why they may be attractive and why they may signal dominance. So first of all, they're probably honest indicators because it's gonna take more energy to produce a longer EOD. And they're already extremely energetically expensive. Estimates vary from around 50 to 60% of their energy budget goes into fueling these electric pulses. And there's also evidence, um, if you're familiar with the handicap principle, there's evidence that um, during the rainy season, that if you check the gut contents of large predatory catfish, the percentage of male mormyrids skyrockets. And the reason for that is as their EODs get longer, the frequency content of their EODs gets lower and it goes into the range of the electroreceptors that catfish have that they can probably detect those EODs. And so there's also, there's this other honesty enforcing major cost of predation. Jonathan. Uh, just related 
Question, does anyone look at whether the electrical signaling traits are under dispersed or over dispersed among some metric species? Uh, are they more so evidence of character displacement? Yeah, are they more, more different or more similar than we expect from a random draw of a species pool? It, that hasn't been formally studied. My impression is that there's no obvious patterns, but it, it hasn't been formally quantitatively studied. And it certainly would be amenable to that kind of study. I think the biggest question is when when we say you know these 18 species are all symmetric, to what extent? I think I think the spatial scale is where, where it's not we're not entirely clear. Like, are they really interacting with each other and interfering with each other in their day to day, or are they occupying slightly different niches? Because the active distance of, an, of these electric signals is not very far. It's only about three or four body lengths. So it would not take, you know, if, if they were specialized on, at different parts of the stream, it wouldn't take a lot for us to think they're right next to each other, but for them to actually be occupying totally different niches and not really interacting with each other. Yeah, thanks. This is great. Um, so you're showing here the diversity of EODs among species. They showed that one species where there was a lot of diversity, a uh -huh. lot of um, intra specific diversity in the EOD. Can you talk about that? Um, do you know anything about that? Or could that have been plasticity in that, within that species? Or do you think that was observed like actual among individual variation? Um, and it was just very curious. Yeah, so the short answer is we really don't know what the cause of that variation is. It does seem like in that particular species, it's age related. So that they tend to get longer as they get older. But no one has done the actual developmental series and no one has studied if, if that's a plastic effect or if that's a genetic effect or a little of both. There's other examples that are even more dramatic than that. So there, um, there's one species. So we've got, so these we would call like a biphasic EOD because they have two phases up and down. There's some, it's kind of hard to see here, but this one has like a small negativity. So that's what we call a triphasic EOD. There's one species where there's two different morphs where some are triphasic and some are biphasic. And we haven't done like, we mean broadly the field. We haven't done like G wasps or other kinds of QTL comparisons to try to figure out like what's the genetic basis of that difference. But doing things like SNPs and basic like structure analyses, there's nothing obvious that jumps out that there's serious differentiation between these two. The, the interesting thing that does come out is that they do seem to segregate geographically. In particular, there's a, there's a waterfall that seems to serve as a boundary where you get a mix of both at the, at the base of the waterfall and only one morph at the top of the waterfall. So there's almost certainly some genetic differentiation going on there. And we've done behavioral experiments to show that they can tell the difference between the two signals. But as to why those two exist and how they're influencing mate choice and gene flow, we have no idea. And there's another one, another species that again, we don't see any clear evidence of genetic differentiation, but their signals are basically what we would call a 90 degree phase shift from each other. So if you think of, um, you do a, a frequency spectral analysis of a signal. You, you can get a frequency spectrum, but you also get a phase spectrum, right? So you have different frequency components that you add up together to create that signal, but you also have a phase of each of those frequency components to create that signal. And if you wanna take a signal and maintain the same frequency content, but maximally distort it in the time domain, what you would do is you would keep the frequency spectrum and shift the phase, phase spectrum by 90 degrees and, and then re reconstruct the signal. And in this one particular species, the two morphs are basically 90 degree phase shifted versions of each other. So they've, for again, reasons we don't know, but they've differentiated intraspecifically into these two morphs that are as different as possible in the time domain in their signals. And the time domain is the critical feature for what they use to recognize each other. So there's really cool stuff there, but we just don't know what it is yet. So uh, to kind of use a neuroscience terminology, uh, you kind of described uh, discharge waveforms in a way. Uh, is there any relationship between waveform and rate of discharge? There seems to be very roughly a negative relationship between the duration of their discharge and the rate of their discharge, which makes sense, right? Both just like physical limitations, the longer your pulse is, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lower limit to how fast you can produce it, right? Um, but also probably energetic considerations that the more energy you're putting in per pulse, the fewer pulses per time you're going to make to, to help mitigate that.
Okay, I think we have time for one question. Yeah, I want to ask for a YouTube question. Um, uh, is electro reception conserved for reacquired products? Good question. So I would expand that question. So that's a good question. So it certainly was not, electro reception did not exist in ancestral mammals. Um, the, I think the really cool question is, was it truly invented de novo, like both in platypus as well as in the fish that we study? Or like I said, it was an ancestral vertebrate sense. I'm sure over time, you know, there, there must have been some degradation in those pathways, but there's probably many shared transcription factors that are involved in the auditory system, the lateral line mechanosensory system, and the electrosensory system. It may be that they didn't truly, the platypus and these other fish that re-evolved it, they may not be truly de novo. They may have actually turned on dormant gene complexes to switch these things back on. So then it would be, you know, what we might call a deeper homology in these pathways. And at some point, there's definitely deep homology because they all sh share uh, ancestry with, with mechanosensory systems. Thank you. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we have time to ask more questions and have refreshments and food just across the hall. So uh, let's give Dr. Chris Carlson one more. Thank you. Okay, okay. Oops, this is not for you. I can leave now, right? Um,